And then that's going. And when it's done, you have to hit it. And you have to hit that one. We don't have a driver for it, so we turned up the audio and the settings the best we could. Okay. So it's louder than last night already. So uh, okay. yeah. I want to warn people about sitting right here because we are picking up the mic is going up right here. Okay. with 
with Steve in the Middle East over the years, uh, as I did, and, and reminiscing about many, many fond memories, some of which are better related in other contexts, perhaps. Um, but, but Steve had a kind of mystique to students for all those years as one of the, the guys of those experiences. But in many real ways, students related that he and that experience uh, were catalysts for their own trajectory, both in thinking about how to understand scripture more deeply, but also uh, awareness of global perspective and, and modern analysis of conflict and politics. So many good things came out of those experiences for, for so many. Uh, one student even said, and this is an exact quote, that, that Steve was at least 30% responsible for them doing a doctorate in physical studies and, and con continuing that path, which I found to be a strangely specific number. <laughs> good job. <laughs> The last thing I would say in appreciation of, of Dr. McKenzie is that many of his publications have reached broad audiences and served our own educational work at Emanuel for many years. When I started at Emanuel, I was handed a textbook that, that Steve edited, uh, introducing students to different methods of biblical studies to reach its own meaning. We talked about all the hidden work that goes into editing a book like that last night. Uh, I, I assigned still that text and also his book on covenant in the Bible for Old Testament theology students, a the wonderfully accessible overview, uh, and, and many more. Like his editing work in the encyclopedia of the Bible and the perception, a tremendous new reference book that our students are using all the time right now. So we are grateful to have him here. We appreciate his many years of teaching and scholarship and the way that they've enriched the lives of our students in more ways than I can now. Uh, before Steve comes to give our second lecture on the book of Jonah, uh, one of our students, Jeremy, will give another reading from the book of Jonah to us. Good morning, everyone. As Dr. Bean said, I will be reading from the book of Jonah, chapters 3 through 4. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed the fast, and everyone great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock, shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city. He made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. 
They came to be in the night and perished in the night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Thank you, Thank you, Alex, for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you all uh, to, uh, who are involved in the community here in Emmanuel for your um, hospitality. You've been very gracious uh, during the last couple of days. So last night we talked about um, issues, problems in Jonah, and particularly the question of the book's main message, the main point main point of the story. In, in this lecture, I want to focus on uh, the question of method, methodology. How do biblical scholars go about addressing those questions that arise in the study of books? For um, those of you who are students, this is a particularly relevant topic. And it is something that over the last 40, 50 years has just exploded in, in biblical scholarship. Uh, to give an example, when I was uh, starting out my career, which turned out to be a career in biblical scholarship, so when I was in the MDM program, kind of where many of you are, we really uh, needed only to learn about four or five different approaches and different methods. Uh, that, was, that was about it. There was what, what was called at the time literary criticism or source criticism, perhaps better known today. That is looking at a text for evidence of different writers, different hands. Uh, we learned form criticism, which focuses on genres, the issue of genre, and also the characteristics of a particular genre, things we look for, um, the type of text. Uh, we learned tradition history, trying to trace the development of a tradition or an idea the storyline, maybe from its earliest roots uh, as an oral, um, an oral tradition, and then all the way to uh, composition and writing. Uh, we learned redaction criticism, which focuses on the, the, the written part of that tradition that developed, and then how the text has been edited, revised. Um, and then we learned textual criticism, basically focusing on how a text is uh, transmitted by scribes. And, and so you, you look at different manuscripts, you look at different versions in translation, and you try to get back to the earliest form of that text that you can, that you can get to. So that was about it, just those, those five. There were a few other Pardon me, a few other um, uh, methods that were kind of in their infancy. Things like economical criticism that Adam mentioned last night, looking at Jonah in the larger context, larger canon. Uh, rhetorical criticism, which, uh, which focuses on the rhetoric in the text, um, and then even comparative in some versions of that approach to. Uh, so, so that was about that was about it. So a, a handful, maybe two handfuls as well. Okay. Fast forward to 2010 uh, and the uh, publication that um, Adam mentioned, the Oxford Encyclopedia of Biblical Interpretation, which I was asked to to uh, edit, to serve as editor in chief for it. And um, I ha had a great board of, uh, of editors, four other people. So they were fabulous. And the first thing we did was to sit down and kind of come up with a list on the spreadsheet of methods that 
very widely recognized. And if you go on to verse 4, Jonah had barely entered the city one day's walk when he cried out. And of our 
RPO. So this is a case where there are multiple methods that that go lie in the background that inform um, this 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 problem or this approach. Okay, that's number one. And, and um, one of the advantages, I should say, of um, uh, this uh, arrangement um, where I'm here and you're there is that uh, we can uh, do this more in terms of um, conversation. So uh, we will have time at the end for questions, that's fine. But if there are points of clarification along the way, please feel free to um, interrupt. Okay. <clears throat> Item number two, or problem number two, is the uh, passage immediately following the one we just looked at. This is in uh, Jonah 3, verses 5 to 9. And the problem here is that what, what you have uh, in the passage is that uh, this is basically the response of the people of Nineveh and, and animals as well to Jonah's message. Okay? Um, and, and we talked about this briefly last night, just a quick summary. Everybody repents, basically, right? And then after that in verse 5, and then if you look at the material in italics, in verses 6 and 7, and the first part of 8 on, on this slide, you have the king of Nineveh issuing a proclamation, a decree, that basically says, okay, everybody repent. You know, uh, pay attention to what Jonah has said. All right. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, that the king's decree at this point doesn't really make any sense because he's telling them to do what they have already done, what they're already doing. Right? The king issues a decree telling the people to repent, wear sackcloth, etc. But they're already doing that. They've, all, they've already repented. So how do you explain this issue? That's, again, that's the problem. We're identifying now. How, how do we approach this? Well, a couple of suggestions that have already been put forward. One, from a historical critical or redaction critical, source critical perspective, is to suggest that the king's decree doesn't really fit and therefore is an addition. But um, sometimes, Mary and I were talking before the lecture, you know, historical criticism has been dominant in the field of biblical studies for so long that a lot of times historical critics have tended to ignore other kinds of explanation. Um, and uh, this is a good case in point because another equally, at least, viable explanation would be if you recognize Jonah as satirical, is to suggest that, the, that this is a portrait of the king as kind of an idiot. Right? That, you know, that, the, that the king of Nineveh is kind of incompetent, he's pompous, he, he issues a decree sort of to take credit for what everybody's already doing, you know, um, and he's behind in time, you know, he's, he's like the guy who says, I gotta catch up with him because I'm their leader. You know, that sort of thing. He's behind me. I, I remember that on the next thing. Uh, so so uh, that's, um, that's another explanation from a more literary perspective. And um, both of those are viable options. Uh, I, I would like to suggest that they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, that, in fact, this could be a later addition, the king's decree. Um, but a later addition uh, to the older, shorter book of Jonah, or version of the story of Jonah, by this 
secondary author editor who really turns the work into a work of satire. Okay. And that's what I think is, is uh, going on with it. Fortunately, there's actually another piece of evidence here, and it's a piece of evidence that is uh, pretty much uh, completely overlooked. Um, but it's a, a bit more tangible in some ways, and it is text critical. Uh, and this also is something that Jack Sasson points out, but he doesn't carry through with it. Right? And what he observes is that if you compare the Hebrew verbs uh, in uh, specifically in uh, verse 8, the Hebrew verb and the Greek verbs uh, in the Greek translation, if you compare them, uh, they are different. The uh, Hebrew verbs here are jasim. Jasim is a, a kind of a third person command. Uh, let them. Let them um, cover themselves in sackcloth let them cry out fervently. Let them repent. Okay, justice. <coughs> the Greek uh, translation in verse eight has not justice, <coughs> excuse me, or optative as we might expect in Greek, but instead has errors, past tense groups. They did this. They covered themselves. They prayed or fasted. They repented. So, what that means in terms of the context of the, of, the, of the text is that in the Hebrew text, verse 8 continues the decree of the king, saying they should do this, they need to do this, let them. Whereas the Greek reading in verse 8 picks up from verse 5 as the continuation of the narrative about the people's repentance, about what they already have done. So there's a difference there in the way that these two witnesses are reading that verse. And often when that happens in textual criticism, we talked about this a little bit last night, um, in the wake of the, the Dead Sea Scroll discovery, the late 1940s. But it's taken decades for us now to begin to understand the real uh, implications uh, of, of those discoveries of the Dead Sea Scroll. And one of the things that they have made clear is that the line that was traditionally drawn between the composition of a book, the writing of a book, versus the transmission of a book, are scribes, copies. That line is pretty blurred. Um, there, there's a lot of composition that continues. Okay? And that evidence of that continuing composition, or the evidence of different variants, or different textual traditions, is often uh, preserved in textual witnesses. Okay? One of the other things that the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown for a number of books of the Hebrew Bible, Samuel, the Samuel of the King, and also the Asian uh, prophets that uh, are probably the is that the Greek translation, the Septuagint, was not done by someone or someone who were just making it up as they went along, but that these were very good and very careful translators who were very liberal in, in their remedies. Now that doesn't hold true for all the books of the Hebrew Bible, but it does for me. And what that means is that they may not have been great translators in the sense of rendering it in good Greek, but they were great translators in terms of helpfulness to us for understanding what they meant, what the text was that they were uh, translating. Right. So when you have this kind of difference in detail between these two different kinds of verbs, it, it, it 
So this is a case of what is called Wiederaufnahme, which means putting a lovely spot. It's really nasty mm -hmm. one, isn't it? Picking up again, yes. Uh, picking up again, um, or or when the subtitles they might say a better English uh, or, or, or literary purposes, narrative resumption. So when you as an editor take a text and you splice something in, you splice it in as point text, and then when you're finished with your splice and you come to the end, you pick up again where you left off. You somehow reiterate. Point X. So, <coughs> you can see this here. If you look at verse 5, uh, this is the report of, of the repentance of the people of Nineveh. They believe God called for a fast rest. Because the last thing that's mentioned here is the investing in sackcloth. You know, the greatest relief. Then, you put in the king's decree in verses 6 and 7. And then where do you pick up again when you're done with the decree? Look at the first part of verse 8. They cover themselves, let them cover themselves with sackcloth. Picks up in the same place where it left off. You see? Narrative resumption, Peter Alpha. It's, it's, uh, again, it's not foolproof. It doesn't prove that there's a narrative here. You can often use this technique too. But it is a technique that is uh, used by uh, editors. So, methodologically, what do we have going on here? Well, we have, again, um, some, some um, historical critical techniques, redaction criticism, source criticism. But we also have um, textual criticism, uh, understood more broadly than just comparing manuscripts, but looking at some of the implications of those differences in um, and we have also uh, you know, literary analysis of, of, this, uh, of this text. Okay, that's problem number two. All right? Moving on. Problem three. Another long standing problem. And that is the location of Tarshish. You may remember <coughs> Tarshish is the place where Jonah tried to flee in the, in the very opening of the book. Um, and outside of that opening, it's mentioned one other time in chapter 4, uh, verse 2, where he explains why he tried to run away. Okay. Why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because um, scholars have located Tarshish in different places. The uh, more traditional, I don't know if um, you can see
somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula or maybe even in Africa, and that the story preserves um, or assumes the existence of a canal built between the um, Mediterranean and the Red Sea. So we have those um, proposals. Uh, I, I want to suggest that um, the traditional site of And there was an article uh, published in 2012 by a British scholar, a very well known British scholar, John Day, who, who uh, went through the evidence and made a pretty compelling case for Carcassa on the southern coast of Spain. Right? But I also want to use this uh, and, and, and these considerations as a kind of a jumping off point for considering a different, a newer kind of method uh, in, in analyzing urban material, namely the method of spatial analysis, okay. spaces, and, uh, and the, the function in effect. So let, let me say a little bit, first of all, about our test sites. I think this is, to some degree, a case of biblical scholars um, missing the forest for the trees. We do that for um, we, we get so focused on a point of grammar or something like that that we kind of miss the bigger picture. And it, it, it seems to me that just from the standpoint of the bigger picture, our castles makes all kinds of sense. You know, um, it, it's a bit of an exaggeration Say that Jonah is told to go east, and the men of it are sort of northeast, but, but still, uh, if you think of it, Syria as east of Palestine, Jonah's probably told to go west, but to go east, what does he do? He heads west just as far as he can go, basically. And, and so, you know, that, that just, just looking at a map, uh, I think, is, is, is always a useful exercise. And in the case of, of Jonah, this is a case where consideration of, of the map and consideration of the narrative just really seem to me you know, to go really well together. Um, if he's going to, to Tarsus, for example, I don't even know why you need to get on a ship. Uh, you know, that's, and, and, and frankly, that's, that's kind of the way, in, at least in part, go from the end of the because you don't go across the desert, you go up over and around. Um, so, I, I, I just think that Tartessos um, really uh, works well there. But, whatever you may decide about the location of Tartessos, uh, or Tartessos, um, or how it fits here, I, I want to draw on some other kinds of considerations. And that is that in terms of Spatial analysis. Spatial analysis certainly emphasizes points on the map, but it does a lot more. Uh, for one thing, it points out that spaces, locations in biblical text often are more than just points on the map, but that they have different functions in terms of quality. What I mean by that is uh, people who are experts in spatial analysis, and I'm not, but people who are, sometimes will talk about first space, second space, third space. They'll, 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 they're, they're categorizing. So first space, actual location. Okay. Uh, second space, uh, something along the lines of mental or conceived location. And third space, something along the lines of idealized location, or places where you can um, start again, or everything is new. So in the case of Nineveh, Nineveh is a, a point on the map, certainly, as is Tarshish, both of them. But, um, but they're both, you know, Beyond first space, there are also second space, third space. It might help, for example, to think of uh, the differences between 
And we may even think of one of them as an exotic um, utopian location, something along those lines. So um, in the case of Tarshish, uh, Jonah, you don't know this, but it doesn't seem like Jonah's ever been there. So it's not just that he wants to go somewhere different. Uh, he conceives of Tarshish as a place where he can get away and start over and begin again. Um, beyond that, uh, spatial analysis also focuses on movements in, in space, um, in location. So uh, there's a real irony and a beauty going on here in terms of Nineveh and uh, Tarshish. Right? Uh, Tarshish is west. West is sunset. West is end. West is dying. West is death. And all of the movement in the first two chapters of Jonah toward Tarshish is all downward. Jonah goes down to Java. He goes down to the ship. He goes down into the hold of the ship. He goes down into the sea. And he goes down into the underworld. So you know, it's all down, down, down. Ironically, uh, Nineveh is east, but east is what? It, 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 you know, Jonah's dreads it, Jonah's favorite, but that's the direction he needs to go in order to, um, to, to, to survive, to live. So, so you have the, the, the movement of, 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 of uh, Jonah from location to location, kind of illustrating in some ways a part of the point um, of the story. Um, so another uh, function of movement is, uh, or, or spatial analysis here, is that spatial analysis also shows in Jonah that Jonah doesn't like interiors very much. He doesn't like being inside the fish, who would? He's not really excited about being inside of Nineveh. He likes much better to be outside um, of, of, uh, of Nineveh and look on from the outside. And finally, one other consideration of spatial analysis is that the, that the story in Jonah <coughs> leaves out a huge chunk of space. That is, there is not a word in it about Jonah's journey from when he's called again, from the Kent Commission again in chapter 3, to when he gets to Nineveh. That's a long way. Uh, and it's a journey that's, that's overland, it is perilous, it is dangerous, nothing at all in the, in the story of Jonah about anything that happened on that journey, on that trip. So that is also revealing in terms of the literature, in terms of the story, because it shows you that this is not, again, a journalistic report. The writer's not interested in getting everything down to happen. The writer's interested in focusing on those parts of the story uh, that the writer uses to make a point, to draw a message. So spatial analysis, right? Four. There's a fourth problem that we're going to look at. I'm out of text. That's fine. The fourth problem that we're going to look at is um, a problem, um, or it's a kind of an overarching problem, um, and that is uh, focusing on Jonah himself. Jonah's reaction. How do we account for why Jonah behaves the way he does? And the approach here uh, that is used uh, and, and can be very helpful to us is what's called trauma theory. Okay. Um, it, it grows out of my understanding, and uh, I think Joni's more of an expert than I, but, uh, but she doesn't have a microphone. So, uh, so uh, the, uh, my understanding of trauma theory is that it kind of has two different um, in terms of biblical study, that there's a part of it that is has its roots in sociology, and 
and it tends to focus on a community and how a community that has been through a traumatic experience uh, uh, hears or experiences a story, a biblical story. I touched on this a little bit last night when we looked at Jewish interpretation of Jonah and, uh, and focusing on mercy versus justice. Right? Um, and so in, in terms of biblical studies, this would uh, look at literature in the Hebrew Bible and reflect on how that literature was read by a community that had experience of God. Specifically, that one we read that. But another branch or root of uh, trauma theory is an approach that grew out of healthcare in the 1970s and dealing specifically with, uh, with what we now call PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. Um, and you know, originally or initially dealing with soldiers returning from warfare who were suffering PTSD, but also the impact of traumatic experiences on the individual and on the activities of the individual. So if you think of Jonah as a traumatized person, it, it allows for a different reading. Uh, Jonah has a number of experiences that could certainly be considered from that. Um, first of all, he's compelled against his will to go to Nineveh, a place that he fears. Um, and just showing up in this city, which is the capital of uh, this uh, empire, and then uh, uttering threats against it, that could you know, set off a little bit of dread in the heart, right? Then he's a passenger on the ship that is assailed by the storm from the sea, and he doesn't know whether he's going to survive that. And he maybe even is more traumatized than the sailors because he knows it's his fault, after all. Then he goes from the ship that's rocking into the sea, and he doesn't know whether he's going to survive there or drown. And then he goes into the belly of the fish, and he doesn't know whether he's going to survive that. So it's one trauma after another after another. And then he gets spit up on dry land, and the narrative doesn't tell us how long, but sometime after that, he's told to do it all over again. Mm -hmm. Go to Nineveh, right? So it's, it's one trauma after another after another. And um, if you start then considering Jonah's activities, I also left off the part in the narrative that, that the story that's unfold, the, the overland journey, from um, Palestine to Nineveh, and he, and he goes that long distance that we know nothing about, also uh, quite likely a traumatic experience. But if you then start looking at the details of the story, um, you can see maybe why some of the things he does uh, would be explained. For example, how is it that he says, um, I serve Yahweh, God of sea and dry land. I believe in Yahweh, and this is my God. And yet, what's he trying to do? Run away. That, 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 that makes no sense. It, it, it's, a, um, it's an inconsistent deed. His, his deed, his, his activities don't match his professed belief. But for a person undergoing trauma, that's not necessarily an unrealistic response. Uh, there are also, if, particularly in chapter 4, when Jonah uh, announces, uh, has announced, uh, Nineveh's decline, Nineveh's fall, and then he leaves the city, um, and somewhere in there, there's a, some problems here, but somewhere in there, 
he finds out that God has decided not to destroy the city, but how does he react? Not the way a typical prophet would react. Right? He's not thrilled, he's not happy, he's angry. And he, and he, he loses it. Yeah. And he lets go of this angry tirade about God being merciful. Um, well, again, maybe not a completely unrealistic reaction on the part of somebody who has gone through trauma after trauma after trauma. And in the conversations in chapter 4, there are places, particularly at the end of chapter 4, verse 4, when God asks Jonah questions, is your fear just, or not, not your fear, is your anger justified? And Jonah doesn't answer. And then the book, remember, ends on the question that Jonah doesn't answer. But again, silence uh, on the part of somebody who is undergoing trauma is not unrealistic, it's not uncommon. So uh, meeting Jonah through the lens, through the eyes of a person who has undergone trauma has some advantages. It explains some of these um, inconsistencies in the book that might not be satisfactorily explicable by uh, historical critical or other means. It also has the great advantage in some ways of allowing us to see Jonah through fresh eyes as a person who is not just or not petulant, selfish, <coughs> disobedient, and stubborn, but rather uh, someone who is in fact strong. And therefore, it allows us to see Jonah uh, with a little more compassion. And compassion is always good. Okay? Five. So, the fifth film of the fifth issue, and again, uh, something I alluded to last night um, animals and the environment. But in particular, animal studies. Animals, as we saw last night, have a remarkable uh, place in the book of Jonah. Animals of one kind or another are mentioned in all four chapters. There's the fish in chapters one and two. There's uh, the animals in the city of Nineveh in chapter three. There are the worm, or there's a worm in chapter four, and then another reference to the animals of Nineveh, also at the end of chapter four. So, a few background comments, first of all, about the species of these different kinds of animals. Um, and this might prove to be a bit more interesting than you might initially think. So, uh, first of all, in popular and artistic renderings of the story, the fish is typically called a whale, as you know. We know that whales are not fish, but are mammals. But I think it's uh, not quite fair to expect that the ancient writers would know that distinction. Um, so on one level, whale is, uh, is an appropriate um, representation, a designation of uh, fish. But there's more to it than that. In the ideology uh, of this story, or, what lies behind the story, the so-called fish probably wasn't a fish. It was a mythological creature, a sea monster, a kraken, if you will. Um, this is certainly the case with the ancient Near Eastern background of, of the story, and, and specifically of the Psalms of Jonah in chapter 2, which But also in Greek literature, in Hellenistic tales, there's a collection of, uh, well, not a collection, there are separate Hellenistic seafaring tales. Uh, I was talking to David Tiger about that last night. That, um, that uh, lie in the background of the story, and I think, frankly, have influenced the story in chapter one. 
That's why I would want to make the book to the help of the kids to understand the text. Um, we have several of these. Just to cite one example, there's a story about the Greek hero of Hercules, or uh, that's the Latin Heracles, uh, who goes inside a sea monster and, uh, and kills the sea monster from the inside. And he does so in order to uh, save the princess Hesse, princess of Troy. Okay. So, so we have stories like that. One, one of the things that those stories, or at least some of them, help to explain in Jonah 1 is why Jonah sailed to Joppa. Because Joppa makes no sense otherwise, but Joppa is common to those stories, those, those uh, Hellenistic tales in, in the uh, uh, late 4th century, early 3rd century. Right? So, uh, this fish in its background would almost certainly a sea monster. And I uh, suggest the last night, and we don't talk about this more this afternoon, but I suggest the last night taking a look at, at the NRSV translation of Matthew 1240. Why? Because you see what the, what the NRSV does is to translate uh, what the Greek says there. And the word that it uses for the, the creature that swallows Jonah is kathos. Mm -hmm. The Greek word kathos, um, which, which is used in sort of more recent Greek for whale, but in its older uh, meaning is, is a kraken, a sea monster. And that's what the NRC translates it. When Jesus says, uh, Jonah is swallowed by a sea monster. So how do you get from sea monster to fish? Well, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that this is that satirical writer who turns the sea monster, the fearful, horrible sea monster, into what? A big fish. Right? Um, so, uh, we have that. Uh, otherwise, why would the writer say that he's swallowed by a fish as opposed to a dragon? The only hint, now moving on to, to chapter 3, the only hint about the animals that are mentioned there is in chapter 3, verse 7, which refers to humans and animals, and then further, cattle and sheep. Both of those are illustrations of a figure of speech called the narrator, which uses two words to uh, often polar opposite to express uh, a larger group. So in English we say, I searched high and low, meaning everyone. Right? Or we say, um, uh, you know, everyone came rich and poor. Rich and poor, everyone. Uh, or all kinds of people. All right. So humans and animals means sentient beings. Cattle and sheep would refer specifically to Domesticated animals. Sheep, oxen, goats, maybe others. <coughs> not dogs. Dogs were not domesticated. They were wild and they were scattered. They weren't kept as pets. Um, you wouldn't expect to find herds of livestock in Nineveh inside the city. Those would be attractive. But there would be some that would be used for conveyance. Um, that would be brought into the market, maybe sacrificed, although Assyrian worship didn't particularly involve animal sacrifice. But the writer did not write about that in the At any rate, um, there's no indication of how many animals are envisioned here. But that's a little bit of background. Finally, 4 7, the, the, the animal, the insect, that eats the plant is identified in different ways. No consensus about what this is. A worm, or maybe a larva, a larvae, um, or uh, some kind of weevil, or my favorite, maggot. Maggot. So the, so the, you know, the, the smallest um, uh, kind of animal. Anyway, <laughs> what makes this amazing, the 
particularly when you throw the knife in it, is that all of the animals in Jonah play team roles in the story. Uh, the fish, the worm, I mentioned this last night, <coughs> are all specially appointed or designated. That word, that verb, occurs four times. By God himself, God appointed, God designated. And again, I just love that image of the Almighty talking to man. You, I choose you. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, so, this common terminology, and, and uh, that they have, they are on the same level with children as, as being chosen for a specific task. A specific task. Um, <clears throat> so, that shows, I think, that the animals and the humans are all part of a system. They're all part of, of a larger entity. Um, and this is uh, then something that is just in its infancy, technologically, in biblical studies, uh, and that is animal study. Considering the roles of animals, um, and frankly, considering them often as and, and the philosophical implications of that. Um, what makes it even more striking in Jonah, of course, is that you have all of these animals in front, and of all of them, the only one who doesn't follow through is Job. Um, all of them, of course, also attest um, God's power over creation. And I might mention that one of those beings that is uh, appointed is also the plant itself. So it's not only animals in some ways, it's also vegetation. Uh, the, the, most of all, most of all, the animals of Nineveh played the most remarkable role in the story. Because, particularly when you look at the end of the book, again, they put on the sackcloth. They repent, they pray, uh, they fast you know, in, in the story. And their acts of contrition move Yahweh not to destroy the city. So uh, uh, we talked about this a little bit last night in the question and answer again, but readers of the Bible have traditionally emphasized Genesis 1 and the idea of human dominion over creation. Maybe it's time to think about Jonah and the idea of a more equal distribution of uh, God's concern, particularly, and I don't know if you saw this recently, but an astounding report just a few days ago released by the World Wildlife Foundation that on average animal population on the planet um, has decreased, declined 70% over the last, uh, since the 1970s, 50 years. So, this set of approaches, this set of problems, again, just a sample, but I hope it's uh, given you some interest, piqued your interest uh, and your appreciation of the book of Jonah, but also uh, some interest in the methods used by the scholars to get out in the region. Thank you very much.
floor uh, for the final lecture, 4 o'clock in this room again. It will be the final lecture on Jonah, and we'll have more time for questions then. But we don't want to hold everyone hostage when lunch is waiting downstairs right now. So uh, we will chew on the, the, the many good things that, that Dr. McKenzie has given us to, to think about, and then we will join each other for lunch downstairs. Uh, and this time then, I would like to welcome Spencer, one of our Master of Divinity students, to give a blessing for us before we head down for lunch, and then you can and dive in. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. In this community that was formed around the shared desire to learn about you, we stand in awe of who you are who we get to be because of you. In the intricacies of Jonah, we find your beauty, your love, and your presence, and we thank you for that means. As we continue to enjoy and consider the words and events we have shared, finding them both informative and stimulating, let us enjoy a meal with one another. Bless this meal and bless the, the community we have around it. Let us celebrate our shared learning and honor our shared experience. We love you and we